we just saw some random variables come up in the bigger number game. Um, and we're going to be talking now about random variables, just formally what they are and their definition of independence for random variables. But let's begin by looking at the informal idea. Again, a random variable is a number that's produced by a random process. So a typical kind of example that comes up where you get a random variable is you've got some system that you're watching and uh, you're going to time it to see when the next crash comes, if it crashes. So the, uh, and assuming that this is unpredictable, that it happens in some random way, then the number of hours from the present until the next time the system crashes is a, 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 is a number that's produced by this random process of whether the system works or not. Um, number of faulty pixels in a monitor when you're building the monitors uh, and uh, delivering them to the actual computer manufacturers, uh, there's a certain probability that some of the pix some of the millions of pixels in the monitor are going to be faulty. Uh, and you could think of that number of pixels is also produced from a, an unpredictable randomness in the manufacturing process. Um, uh, a, one that really is modeled in physics as random is when you have a Geiger counter, you're measuring alpha particles. The number of alpha particles that the, are detected by a given Geiger counter in a second is uh, believed to be a random number. Uh, uh, there's a distribution that it has, but the number of alpha particles is uh, not always the same from second to second. Uh, and so it's a random variable. And finally, um, we'll look at, at the standard abstract example of flipping coins. And if I flip coins, uh, then the number of heads in a given number of flips, let's say I flip a, a coin n times, the number of heads will be another rather standard random variable. OK, what is abstractly a random variable? Uh, oops, I'm getting ahead of myself again. Let's look at that example of three fair coins. So each coin has a probability of being heads that's a half and tails being a half. I'm going to flip the three of them. And I'm going to assume that they're distinguishable. So there's a first coin, a second coin, and a, uh, and a third coin. Or alternatively, you could think of flipping the same coin, coin three times. So uh, the number of heads is a number that comes out of this random process of flipping the three coins. So it's a number that's either from zero to three. There could be no heads or all heads. So it is a basic example of a random variable um, where you're producing this integer based on how the coins flip. Another one uh, is simply a zero one valued random variable where it signals one if all three coins match in what they come up with and zero if uh, they don't match. All right. Now, once I have these random variables defined, one of the things that's convenient, a uh, convenient use of random variables is to use them to define various kinds of events. So the event that c equals 1, that's an event that, uh, you know, it's a random, uh, it's a set of outcomes where uh, the count is 1 and it has a certain probability. This is the event of exactly one head. There are three possible outcomes among the eight outcomes of heads and tails with three coins. So it has probability 3 eighths. I could also just talk about the outcome that c is greater than or equal to 1. Well, c is greater than or equal to 1 um, when there is at least one head. Or put another way, the only time that c is not greater than or equal to 1 is when you have all tails. So there's a 7 eighths chance. 7 out of 8 outcomes involve one or more heads. So the probability that c greater than or equal to 1 is 7 eighths. Uh, here's a, a weirder one. I can use the two variables c and m to define an event. What's the probability that c times m is greater than 0? Well, uh, since c and m are both non-negative variables, the probability that, they're both, that, that their product is greater than 0 is equal to the probability that each of them is greater than 0. OK. What does it mean that m is greater than 0 and c is greater than 0? Well, it says there's at least one head. That's what c greater than 0 means. And m greater than 0 means all the coins match. This is an obscure way of describing the event all heads. And it has, of course, probability 1 8th. Now we come to the formal definition. So formally, a random variable is simply a function that maps outcomes in the sample space to numbers. The, we, all, we think of the 
uh, the outcomes in the sample space as the results of a random experiment. They, they, uh, they are an outcome and they have a probability. And when the outcome tr is translated into a real number that you think of as being produced as a result of that an uh, outcome, that's what the random variable does. So formally, a random variable is not a variable or it's a function that maps the sample space to the real numbers. And it's got to be total, by the way. It's a total function. Usually, it's, it's this would be a real, num uh, a real valued random variable. Usually, it's the real numbers. It might be a subset of the real numbers, like the uh, integer valued random variables. Occasionally, uh, we'll use uh, complex va valued uh, random variables. Actually, that happens in, in physics uh, uh, a good deal in quantum mechanics, but not for our purposes. Um, which is going to mean real value from now on when we talk about random variables. So abstractly or, or intuitively, what the random variable is doing really is it's just packing together, packaging together in one object R, the random variable, a whole bunch of events uh, that are defined by the value that R takes. So for every possible real number, if I look at the event that R is equal to A, that's an interesting event, and it uh, it's part of it's one of the basic events that uh, that R puts together. And if you knew the answer to all of these R equals A's, then you really know a lot about R. Um, and with this understanding that R is a package of, of, of events of the form R is equal to A, then a lot of event properties carry right over to random variables directly. That's why this little topic of introducing random variables is also about independence, because the definition of independence carries right over. Namely, a bunch of random variables are mutually independent if the events that they define are all Independent, mutually independent. So if and only if the events that are each event defined by R1 and R2 and through Rn, that set of events are mutually independent, no matter what the values are chosen that we decide to look at for R1 and R2 through Rn. Okay. And of course, there's an alternative way. We can always express independent events in terms of products instead of um, uh, uh, pro conditional probabilities. So we could say, or, or and instead of invoking the idea of mutual independence, we can say explicitly where it comes from as an equation. It means that the probability that R1 is equal to A1 and R2 is equal to A1 and Rn is equal to An is equal to the product of the probabilities, of the individual probabilities that R1 is A1 times the probability that R2 is A2. And the definition then of mutual independence of the random variables R1 through N, Rn holds is that this equation, uh, it holds for all possible values, little a1 through little an. So let's just practice. Our, the variable c, which is the, the count of the number of heads when you flip three coins, and m, the 0, 1 valued random variable that tells you whether a, there's a match, are they independent? Well, uh, certainly not, because there's this definitely a positive probability that uh, the count will be 1, that you'll get at least a head. Uh, and there's a positive probability that they all will match. It's, it's a probability of a quarter. So the product of those two is positive. Um, but of course, the probability that you match and you'll have exactly one head is zero. Because if you have exactly one head, you must have two tails and there's no match. Um, so uh, without uh, thinking very hard about what the probabilities are, uh, we can immediately see that uh, the product is not equal to the probability of the conjunction or the and, and therefore they're not independent. Well, here's one that's a little bit more interesting. Um, in order to explain it, I got to set up the idea of an indi indicator variable, which itself is a very important concept. So if I have an event A, I can package A into a random variable, just like the match random variable was really packaging the event that the coins matched into a 0, 1 valued variable. I'm going to define the indicator variable for any event A to be 1 if A occurs and 0 if A does not occur. So now I have I'm able to capture everything that matters about an event A by the random variable I sub A. Uh, if I have I sub A, I know what A is. And if I have A, I know what I sub A is. And um, that means that really I can think of events as special cases of random variables. Now, when you do this, uh, you, need a, you need a sanity check. Because remember, we've defined independence of random variables one way. 
I mean, it's a concept of independence that holds for random variables. We have another concept of independence that holds for events. Now, the definition for random variable was motivated by the definition for events, but it's a different definition uh, of independence of different kinds of objects. Now, if this correspondence between events and indicator variables is going to make sense and not confuse us, it should be the case that um, uh, two events are independent if and only if their indicator variables are independent. That is, uh, IA and IB are independent if and only if the events A and B are independent. And this is a lovely little exercise. It's like a three-line proof for you to verify. I'm not going to bother to do it on the slide because it's good practice. So this would be a moment to stop and verify that using the two definitions of independence, the definition of what it means for IA and IB to be independent as random variables, and comparing that to the definition of what it means for A and B to be independent as events, they match. Um, if we look at the event of an odd number of heads, uh, we can ask now whether the event m of their uh, of the the which is the indicator variable for a match the random variable m and the indicator variable i sub o are are dependent or not now both of these depend on all the three coins um, i sub o is looking at all three coins to see if they're an odd number of heads m is looking at all three coins to see if they're all heads or all tails and it's not clear with all that common uh, basis for, for returning what value they have it's not well, immediately obvious that they're independent but as a matter of fact they are and again this is absolutely something that you should check out if you don't stop the video now to work it out you should definitely do it afterward um, it's an important little exercise and it's easy to check all you have to do is check that the, uh, the uh, probabilities uh, of the event of an odd, uh, the, uh, that the event odd number of heads and the event all match are independent as events, or you could use the random variable uh, definition uh, and uh, check that these two random variables were independent by checking uh, four equations, because this can have value zero and one, and this can have value one, uh, zero and one. Remember with random event, with independent events, we had the idea that if A was independent of B, it really meant that A was independent of everything about B, in particular it was independent of the complement of B as well. And a similar property holds for random variables. So intuitively, if R is independent of S, then R is really independent of any information at all that you have about S. Um, and that can be made more precise, that R is independent not of any information about S by saying, pick an arbitrary function that maps r to r, total function. So um, what I can do is think of f as giving me uh, some information about the value of s. So if r is independent of s, then in fact r is independent of f of s, any transformation of s by a fixed non-random function. And of course, the notion of k-way independence carries right over from the event case. If I have k random var if I have a bunch of random variables, um, uh, a large number, much more than k, they're k-way independent if every set of k of them are mutually independent. And of course, as with events, we use the two-way case to call them pairwise independent. Again, we saw an example of this in terms of events already, but we can rephrase it now in terms of indicator variables. If we let hi be the indicator variable for a head on a flip i of, uh, uh, of the i flip of a coin, where i ranges from 1 through k, if we have uh, uh, k, k coins and hi is the indicator variable for how coin i came out, um, whether or not there's a head, now, O can be nicely expressed. The, the notion that there's an odd number of heads is simply the mod 2 sum of the HIs. Uh, and this, by the way, is a, a, a trick that we'll be using regularly that events now uh, can be defined rather nicely in terms of doing operations on the arithmetic values of indicator variables. So O is nothing but the mod 2 sum of the values of the indicator variables uh, HI from 1 to K. And uh, the what we saw when we were working with their event version is that any k of these events are independent. I've got k plus 1. There's k hi's and there's o, which makes the k plus 1th, uh, k plus 1st.
Um, and the reason why any k of them were independent was discussed in the previous slide when we were looking at the events of there being an odd number of heads and, uh, and, a, and a head coming up on the i-th flip. The reason why pairwise independence gets singled out is that we'll see that for a bunch of major applications, uh, it's pairwise, applica pairwise independence is sufficient. Um, and rather than verifying mutual independence, it's harder to check mutual independence. You've got a lot, a lot more equations to check. Um, and, uh, and in fact, it, doesn't, it often doesn't hold in circumstances where pairwise does hold. So this is good to know. We'll be making use of it uh, in an application later when we look at um, uh, sampling and the law of large numbers.